I'm Katie Wolf, and I'm with Pacific Northwest National Lab. And today's panel is on transportation and cybersecurity. Um, I did notice on the agenda it said security and privacy, so we are going to broaden a little bit um, so our presenters are prepared uh, more generally. Um, that is completely within the, the realm of uh, possible for this panel. And we're going to have four presenters today. Um, and what I'm going to do here is get them introduced really quickly and then let each of them uh, give a 15 to 20 minute talk and we'll have questions interactively. I think that's probably okay with everybody. We're a small group. And then I'm going to talk too much and I'm going to start uh, talking like a seal. So the, the topic here is transportation cybersecurity and kind of the framework for the discussion is that the emergence and continued evolution of smart cities are providing a wealth of benefits to our community. But with these advancements come the requirement to meet the security demands of advanced technology and increased connectivity. Research indicates that malware, ransomware, and denial of service attacks are the threats that top concerns of the professionals seeking to keep the smart city citizens secure and safe, while also ensuring that city management, governance, services, and infrastructure are also protected and functional. Looking at just the transportation sector, often cited as being the most critical and threatened, it becomes immediately apparent that it relies on a complex assembly of infrastructures. In addition, the mobile nodes of the transportation networks, the vehicles themselves are becoming increasingly interactive, networked, autonomous, and complex. The impact of any of these previous existing threats on smart cities has potential for severe or even catastrophic effects. Cities are then presented with the challenge of how to adequately protect the transportation system given the financial, physical, and functional realities that exist. How can we better inform policymakers and stakeholders in order to strategically improve cybersecurity design, procurement, government, and management? And how can risk be mitigated? Excuse me. And how can risk mitigation be enhanced and improved? Are there measurable and objective metrics that can aid decisions and verify effectiveness? In this panel, we will discuss a variety of approaches, test fitting, tailored vulnerability assessment modeling and simulation, and how employing these approaches to empower risk management initiatives which will result in more efficient, effective, and affordable cybersecurity. And each panelist very kindly sent me their bio and their abstract, so I can do an introduction of them. But at this point, I'm gonna uh, let each of them introduce themselves, and so nobody has to hear me talk. Lance, would you like to step forward and go first? Thank you. 
And so sometimes I like to think about it. You know, I'm uh, like a uh, double seven, right? In action, the only cooler because I don't have to have a full you know, body of sweat. I have to change into my guy instead. All these zeros and ones. <laughs> so it's a really cool gig. Um, and then it turned it into M uh, because of the job function. So I like to say tongue in cheek. Uh, cyber 007 uh, turned M. That's me. So in today's um, talk, it won't be long because I, I think I'm going to <laughs> listen to the other experts uh, who have more focus on the transportation side. Just uh, I'm going to just uh, cover uh, the low. I mean uh, that touches on the cybersecurity. So that we know where there are some convergence. Points how uh, things could be of help to uh, people on the ground. So to begin with, there's one thing that people have been talking about IT and OT and convergence at all. Um, what a convergence, right? This is kind of the one situation. I, I think it's Cisco, my former employer, uh, employer, um, who had this neat um, poster. <laughs> IT, OT says, "Cheers, thank you." being uh, the master of uh, malware, because a lot of the uh, malware comes through the IT uh, <laughs> arena. Uh, but now what? With IT OT conversion, they actually could become the low hanging fruits, a attack vector, um, right? Especially in the transportation field. So what are we going to, um, to consider? To begin with, uh, some things like the privacy uh, considerations. We, I know we have experts like Aaron there who have extensive knowledge in the privacy uh, field. So for myself, I'm just going to just quickly um, have a high level, uh, 3,000 feet uh, level view just to bear some notions in mind. Um, currently, the privacy always requires this in case notice, right? Users need to be noticed. Um, if you have heard about the uh, GDPR, you know, <laughs> everyone, especially the large ones, you better be doing something. Otherwise, the penalty can be very hefty. Uh, consent, users need to give them their consent before you can collect anything. Uh, access, um, security, and enforcement. Access over there also implies that people, if they decide to terminate their relationship, you need to wipe it. By wiping, it means not only just deleting in the current database all the backup things, need to be completely off um, without any trace of the data, which up to now is not a requirement in the United States. So it's still in the process of getting the compliance in place. And then the security and enforcement, that kind of uh, uh, also merges into the cybersecurity uh, area. But we'll get to that a little bit more. So now that being said, that's pretty well understood, I think, in the United States. But what the IoT smart devices um, now is more uh, kind of more. Some people say onset. Some people say onslaught is more like it. Like it or not, because it is coming, um, and governments could feel really welcome, uh, well overwhelmed rather uh, about it if we don't have a strategy, right? Um, and then the even more troubling part right now, probably when you think it, is that the ownership is not very well defined. Um, the municipality, for example, if some of them would like to get some monetization plan going, you know, with some income in return, all the service, your um, residence, right? So it's all good, but still, you want to be really careful as to who owns the data, whether the municipality has the right to, to handle a data in a certain way. Um, so those, while those uh, down the line get uh, clarified more and more, I'm sure the professionals will uh, keep their eyes closely watching these things. And I want to have also plugging a little bit uh, in that under the umbrella of GCPC, we also have a now a service group called the Advisory Committee um, that will be there as either to help uh, and facilitate the information sharing and provide some quick wins to support the implementation. That has been 
cảm thương vì thân thế này là sản phẩm gì nữa. So there are these challenges. Um, early practitioners, this particularly is uh, Francisco in 2017, they did a survey of uh, 180 uh, practitioners in the uh, hospitality field in terms of the uh, smart transportation, uh, the organizations, what they have done, etc. So these are some findings from it. So I'll just share quickly with you all. If you have uh, seen it before, bear with me. The top threats, APT, um, advanced persistent threats. These, these are the kind that um, took down, or well, I shouldn't say took down, but that um, successfully uh, got into uh, Google a few years back, right? So what they do is they try to evade the detection of your system. And instead, so whatever they do, they bypass. They say, oh, every day, triple ring effect, so that your existing monitoring detection cannot even pick them up. And therefore, over time, they build up to a point that they got your network all mapped out, and they can get you on it. So that's one example. And over here, 30% uh, of the people surveyed feel that this um, attacks on mobile devices, on cloud infrastructure, are the hardest to defend. And then 59% um, felt that, yeah, on um, mobile and um, infrastructure, I just mentioned already also. And the challenging part in defending these implementations Uh, implementation. 
competition across the board and uh, across the world, really. And with that, I conclude. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. trying very hard at Cosme to actually 
more to the fact than what we're going to talk about today, security and privacy go hand in hand. Um, this idea and me kind of laying out some, some frameworks here that you really can't have privacy without good security, but a good secure system can have that privacy. There are humans involved, which is also the best part. And I think everybody in this room obviously knows that security is just not the default. We should change that paradigm and be part of that change, but right now it's just a reality. So work has to be done on every implementation to make sure that it is secure and it's supporting privacy rights as much as possible or as practical for that situation. So Isaac gave us a couple of examples and I'm happy to go through in more detail. You might want to use these as part of our, our panel discussion. But you know, this is, I think everybody's probably familiar with what happened at Strata and the ability to identify military bases or other critical installations um, by virtue of the truly de-identified data. I mean, they de-identified it by a common standard and it was still uh, not having the intended effect, shall we say. Not a one, I think people are also familiar with this. I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, you know, here again, de-identified data done for the purpose of trying to understand traffic routes and traffic planning uh, ended up having an unintended consequence of violating privacy. So this is in this objective, like I'm skipping over all this because I want to make this because if anybody wants to talk about this, I am happy to talk about this. But disability manageability is really critical. We try very hard to implement those when necessary, and I think to this is our part of the community and understand how hard that can be in reality. So if some of the conversation that I want to elicit some input on from some the folks that are here today. These are all the privacy and non-consent concept is something that's near and dear to Calvary Heart. I think it is part of the conversation we should be having, especially in light of some of the things that are happening to make something that was de-identified. If these unintended consequences are going to happen more and more and we're dealing with them, it's always in that first world. The more we have the ability to, to crunch data faster, do more data, we're trying to use this data and save people lives. We need to think through on the front end how we engineer it, how we use it, and how we share it. To try to make sure that we've thought through and mitigated as many of the unintended consequences as possible. Ms. Cram, everybody pretty much So the, the piece that I want to have people take away from this is that that green box on the bottom is sort of the, for lack of fashion, the valley of death between algorithm development and real world implementation. For cryptographically secure solutions, in, in particular in the effect of privacy and security. Because it's not always a trade off between functionality and privacy or functionality and security at large. The technology exists today and we need to just think about it in a different way about how we engineer and how we manage the flows of information that we're trying to accomplish in order to improve people's quality of life. So Encrypted Smart Data Repositories, this is one of the things that we're very actively working on in this public transportation space, as well as some other public um, accessible information, health records. It has a number of applicable use cases. Um, really trying to, and this is that same green box that we have on the previous slide, right? How do you create an environment where people who are specialists in either Internet of Things or driverless vehicles, like vehicles that are autonomous, but also up to and including transportation systems, public facing systems, and health systems. People have lots of <coughs> lots of specialization that's going on into the nature of those systems, how we deal with them, how we deal with flows, how we deal with privacy. One of the things that seems to be missing is talking across systems, talking across jurisdictions, and from a software perspective, isolating the 
necessary knowledge and implementation strategies associated with publicly or public-private data is actually one of the things that we scary and concerned with our students as well. So we're looking at better ways to ensure that individuals have um, control of their information with you know, differential security, the, the ability to control who, who sees it for how long and in what capacity. And with that, I will conclude. I'm happy to answer questions now or later. Um, go easy on me because I'm new to the college team. Um, I do have a backup in the room if you want to identify at the moment. But, um, I am pleased to be here and look forward to seeing you guys. Those that are most important, and as 
restructuring of your defenses, your defense posture, to address those things of most significant importance and that takes you to the left bank of your body. So in, in approaching this, we want to take a being a national level, we want to take a scientific approach. We want to look to see how we can test and measure and repeat experiments and come up with those things that could help the decision makers, the stakeholders, prioritize how they're going to address a security problem. Make sure that a, a threat that has been identified is an actual threat in the environment where they will be operating. And come up with a effective and efficient solution for mitigation for that risk. And that's what we've been trying to do in looking at the vehicles, the air, uh, aircraft, uh, cargo containers, automated uh, facilities that, that, that can move cargo around. And, uh, something in the lab that we like to do is uh, rigorous scientific part testing, creating a test bed that is flexible and adaptable and that can plug in the various pieces that you would see in an OT or an IT environment. And then exposing that test bed to uh, a set of viruses, uh, a coordinated attack, some sort of an impediment for that system operating. And make this a repeatable process so that you can try different defense strategies against that threat and come up with a actual measurable set of metrics and results to either validate or invalidate different approaches. Same thing goes with modeling and simulation. There are certain places where actually setting up a virtual network are practical. You need to develop a, an effective model and then run countless simulations against it to verify what, uh, you know, what your test case is going to come to prove. The tricky part is knowing when you can apply one set of scientific tools versus the other, or when to feed one to the other. For example, if I model a very large transportation network and then throw impediments at that, how do I know that the impediment that I am throwing into that model is representative of what happens in the real world? Well, in this case, maybe one takes step back to the test bed. And we will find the devices that we are worried about this vulnerability impacting, and we test them in the test bed, and we see in a more real world, more actual uh, scenario, what the results of a certain attack would be. Now we know better how to model that result into a large scale following simulation environment. So we're not just saying, well, we're gonna model a denial of service attack and we're just gonna take out this node. When in fact, if we look at what happened in the test bed, it's well, yes, it kind of took out that node, but it took out 80% of it. And it functions in this reduced fashion or it has this impact that spreads out over a larger area. And now we can model that into the larger scale model of the simulation environment with a much more rigorous repeatable and accurate scientific instrument of That's kind of my passion, is bringing this, this rigor uh, into the, the real world, the scientific rigor into the real world, so that we can better inform decision makers and policy uh, makers uh, about how they can uh, address these emerging threats in the EV network environment. With that, I will walk away. <laughs> and last but definitely not least, Mr. Scott Owsley, he's a Deputy Director of the Cybersecurity Division within SEC at DHS, and we're pleased to welcome him to our panel. things 
on the transportation that are worth remembering, I think, for all of us. Uh, in the work that each of us is doing where we are, in talking to people that should be using this work, and talking to sponsors, funders, requirements, or whatever. Um, and that is that this is a perhaps the most valuable use case within the whole smart city effort. And, and the reason I say that is, is two reasons. One is it's, it's an area with a massive amount of data, with a massive amount of history. So any study, analysis, examination of something, you can go back and look at something some years ago or some other place. Everybody's got transportation questions and so on. And so it's one of the most versatile and rich areas of study because we can do some comparisons and connections and whatever else you want. The other reason it's very, very important to all of us is it's also the area where all of the data ownership and privacy and information questions collide at the same time. Because when you think about it, almost every transportation environment we're talking about something mechanical, probably automated, if not already, et cetera, along with a human in there that usually is carrying some smart device that it, you know, it's part of his brain, it's part of that person, et cetera. And so the data flows inherently involve both easy engineering questions and user data, elements of pattern of life, or whatever. And there are multiple companies of different kinds that want that data. The insurance companies, the automotive companies, people that want to keep the data themselves. You know, stop and think about it. There will come a day when you'll have a major food fight in Congress and ACLU and everything else over the fact that, wait a minute, my iPhone's spying on me while I'm in the car and now GM has the data. And it, you know, that will happen. It's just a question of when. And so on the one hand, transportation smart city activities is inherently easy and engineering interesting and, and a lot of stuff you can do. It's also messy and difficult in all the same ways that many of these areas and questions. And so I'm not sure most other smart city areas have that combination of very, very rich capability to investigate and apply and do something with all of the messiness inherently already percolating out. I don't know if people caught the news a day or two ago, but the uh, the CEO of Audi was jailed as a preemptive measure to keep him from contaminating or influencing the ongoing automotive investigation with VW. And I think that's an indication of the fact that transportation is as rich a topic to investigate these things because there happens to be obviously some probably or whatever criminal activity in that history of, of fudging the numbers and everything else, but it shows you how pervasively connected this particular topic, smart city transportation, <coughs> and that's why it's important to study. And in some ways it's easy to study, and in some ways it's important to study because both of those things play together. So that was the, the one thing I wanted to make sure it was brought up and put in people's minds. Because sometimes we can forget in talking to our colleagues and sponsors and whatever, you know, this is why we should pay attention to it. Well, this is a topic, transportation and smart cities, that you can knock on the table and, and draw people's attention to because of that combination of data. So, Katie, let me uh, right. give the Q&A back to you. And then again, I think we've got some savvy people in here. I would call on people or invite them to ask questions and see where the conversation goes. Indeed, I would much prefer that, that the question come from the audience and the questions come from me. So I think we have microphones um, at all the tables. If you, if you need it, please definitely use it. And if you don't need it, we're a pretty small group. Feel free to just speak up and shout. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll open the floor, the floor to everyone. Does anyone have any questions on any of the um, talks that we've heard today? Burning question at the back table. Not really a burning question, but um, I, I don't know if it was a couple of years ago or something. There, there was going to be a, 
Is it a sensor palooza or it's going to be a, a demonstration, a, a gathering and a demonstration of various kinds of IoT sensors. And one of the things that I was thinking about since then was this whole uh, security ecosystem for IoT. You know, coming from from the perspective of smart meters, we digitally sign the meter itself, the, the data that's passed from the meter up to the billing system has got uh, cryptographically uh, trusted information in it so that billing can take place. This is a, a, a dollar value. This is, if, it, if it's broken, it means that people are being cheated and, and the billing is inaccurate. So it's really important that that take place accurately and that, that it's trusted. And that's been the technology for some time is to digitally sign each one of those meters as they're being manufactured and that signature goes up to the network and the processing and so forth. So I think about this in the same way is, is that extensible in, the, in a general sense for IoT sensors and saying, yes, it's really me, I'm really a sensor at the end of this network and I'm not spoofing video data, I'm not spoofing audio data, you know, you can trust that this source of data is dependable because I've identified myself as a real endpoint. And th that's exclusive of the fact that how does that ever happen? In other words, who has the right to put that digital signature in that endpoint? That's, that's a different issue altogether. That's kind of policy. But from a technology standpoint, I'd love to see that sort of demonstration of how do we extend those things that are out there already that prove our identity prove the level of trust in a network, and that help facilitate the growth of the deployment of IoT sensors. Trust is one thing, right? So we know the identity is there, the data is valid. That's also a little bit separate from individuals and communities trusting that that data actually should be collected and how it's collected. That's policy and that's outreach and that's educating the public and that's showing that there's a benefit for this kind of data and that we've applied some kind of controls to that. And I like the presentation earlier about security, about cutting up a video stream into pieces, encrypting those pieces in real time, and then showing that that data is very difficult to have a man in the middle attack or to extract that data from the stream. Those are other kinds of technology and applications that help the IoT sensor business move forward, for smart cities to move forward Obviously, they want a, a huge infrastructure that tells them exactly what's going on in their city. They want to know if there's an emergency, if there's a fire, if there's a weather front, if there's an earthquake, if there's a storm, a flood, a hurricane, uh, whatever it is, so that they can be responsive and mitigate all of the damages that occur in any of those conditions. Uh, so, so my core question is, how do we get to the point where we identify those kinds of examples those kinds of tests, those kind of that prototyping. It took me back to that sensor palooza thing someone had suggested a couple of years ago, which is getting everybody together, like they used to do an interop, to show that you know people interoperated on TCP IP stacks in the early internet, and show that, that we can do that in the IoT space in a trusted way. So um, that, that's I'm a question for everybody. Not panelists, just, but um, why don't we go backwards and start with Scott? Well, the thing in my head is, in trying to think about it is, I don't know the trade space, the trade show space very well. The consumer electronics show strikes me as the consumer level version of what you're asking about. What I don't know is, does CES have a huge industrial wing, or is there an IES type trade show? Because that's where I think you're getting to with the sensor palooza, where at a wholesale elements, at a middleware element, you know, who's producing what that does what for the business to business crowd, the industrial crowd, et cetera. Sort of like what you see happening at CES for all of the stuff that the people are showing off on where they're headed in terms of retail sales of all sorts of smart devices. Yeah, I'm not sure that that is. That's just kind of a general question yeah. is if for the data super cluster, that's kind of one of the things that we're trying to identify is where can yeah. our membership go to learn a little bit more about these models and potentially see them demonstrated. So we like what they did over here with high phone, you know, the Bluetooth, low, low power Bluetooth, secure enclave and a, and a separate card. I think that's interesting identification stuff for the endpoint. Low cost, easy to implement, trustworthy 
really easy to explain. Um, that's the kind of thing that, that excites the students. Yeah. I've got another wrinkle on top of that. I don't have a solution, but I've got another problem I can answer. Because <laughs> uh, that's what I do. Um, let's say you've got a device and it's got a signature and we've got this uh, infrastructure in place so that we know if this device is reporting, we can trust it because we know who the user is. Quite often I run into firmware updates, software updates, where the software itself isn't even functioning. So what are the requirements that flow down from that trusted device? Now how do I interact with that device with updates and other things to ensure that those updates aren't corrupting the, 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 the absolute best thing I'm going to put on my evil hat, but the absolute best thing I can have is a device that is trusted and acknowledged and signed and it has all the, the, the correct keys, and I'm already inside it, and it can sit that thing. So there's the next level on to the, to that question. Oh, yeah, I, I think this is really what we're talking about, because it's experiments, right? I mean, are we just doing theory, or is that security is not a, a fire and forget? Right. And you can't design it up front and then you only have to do it one time. Even the static, there is no static event anymore. There's no static environment anymore. <coughs> They're all dynamic and they're pushed in the same big way. So if you're not thinking about your security for your entire lifetime, if you include these emission measures for the upgrade stage, then you're you're creating something that happens. But it's not just the emission, maybe somebody installed not me badly, but installed bad software to get the adder on the file. Um, or maybe somebody was doing their emails in Rush and they clicked on something they shouldn't have clicked on. I mean, what, what part of the... What They're all process things that you're describing. Yeah, 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 everything yeah, is yeah. all process. And then Pro process and people. And there's but you have to be able to take that process and convert it into trust and then convey that <coughs> trust around the network. But then people have to understand it or they're not going to do it. Sure. Right. And, yes. and, and you, you sometimes, I, I sometimes worry and think that it's a slow technology or something that'll fix it. But if it's a, sure. if it's a person problem and you yeah. haven't educated them and they're finding ways yeah. to circumvent the process. Well, that's what my talk before, just before it was about is like, because all the problems you're talking about, I mean, I hate to sound like, you know, blockchain is a hammer for every problem, but the problems you're describing are problems that distributed ledgers doesn't mean that it has to be blockchain because blockchain, I'm sorry, distributed ledgers existed before blockchain, mm -hmm. right? But there's no blockchain that's not a distributed ledger model. Um, so the, mechanically, the mechanism of conveying trust around the network is what blockchain does, right? But you still need to have the front end processes and the understanding that as a business person, as a manager, as a bureaucrat, whatever, you have to have an understanding of what the technology allows you to do. Right, and we're piling onto that in the form of TLC and blockchain as a technology. for actually good interface process. engineering, process engineering, making right. the process superior, but making it transparent. I mean, those of us kind of of an age where I can send you a cell phone to your life and say the iPhone, right? There's a huge difference in how easy it is to navigate for people. We need to make security encryption that easy for everyone. But if it's not that easy, you have to train people to do it. I mean, blockchain is not going to stop you from doing something simple. I just don't understand why that's not well, no, that's I not that you, blockchain is going to stop you from doing stupid, but understanding the process and then this um, system as a trust conveyance and also um, a process, um, uh, a, a way to audit, uh, automate automate the auditing of things that happen, right? Yeah. So you could hit the wrong button, and if you have a failsafe in the system that says, if there's anything that's out of this range, don't do whatever, so, so you can account for those things if you have the process and you understand the steps, you understand all the actors, and you've done everything with the system. And, and I mean, Facebook does this all the time. Why do you think the, uh, they're able to, to move people's behavior in the way that they are? Because they've done this work to figure out what are the things they need to do, what are the motivators, what are the triggers. So you have to go to that level with the system that's designed to understand how to potentially mitigate the issues. I think we I think we're jumping around an awful lot though too in that you know 
there are machine-to-machine -machine interactions that are, that are uh, potentially easier to solve than human-machine interactions. Because, you know, if, if we say the protocol for a human is update your operating system so it isn't hackable, and, and you find out 50% of people don't update their operating right. system, the fix is already there, but that's, your, that's a different kind of process problem than a SCADA process or a, a manufacturer sure. or someone else that has a power grid right. that says, I must do this for our survival as an organization. Right. So that becomes, uh, you know, that becomes a mandate for good behavior within a corporate environment. It becomes part of the DNA of their operations. So, so, so what I was pointing to is like on the IoT and the machine side of things, what can we do to, to, to demonstrate that IoT technology can be adopted by smart cities, by smaller communities, and so forth, and reduce that friction. If I jump all the way over to the human interface and say I've got to fix that as well, then the scope of my problem is is well, uh, nearly impossible. The machine to interaction is still yeah. a human problem, right? Yeah. They, to, to say that there's no human involved in that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I just say reducing the scope to say I've got a controllable environment where I want to set a blueprint up that says right. if you're going to deploy these kinds of sensors, these are the highly recommended things that you do. That's and right. that should be part of your plan right. before you achieve any compliance with a blueprint. Right. That's all. And so and is there any accreditation body who has standards and requirements around that? Does that exist? Well, I mean, there's. So we, we just had a great conversation about the, uh, the SANS group and their yeah. recommended, right. recommended series of things that you can do. And, and so there are models that are out there, but that's part of what we're trying to do in the data super cluster is to say, what is it that we can do to help lubricate the marketplace for IoT deployment and smart sensors for smart city applications? So that, that's my motivation in asking the general question of where can we go to get examples of that? Well, and well I was going to say. And those are good proofs. Is it, if they don't work because of human non-compliance, we need to know that too. Right. Well, yeah, and on that, I just want to chime in very quickly about the cybersecurity market. There are so many solutions. Uh, I mean, one of the RCA's uh, conferences, over 4,000 vendors showed up. And that is not everybody. We know for sure, right? So that does not make life easy at all for someone like the data um, cluster to go about and then say, what are the necessary things we want to consider, and then what are some supporting technologies to kind of help you save time, right? So if I hear you correctly, that piece, we can work hand in hand together, because uh, we do know some uh, vendor solution side, they are collaborating with us, and we also, from a third party perspective, uh, evaluate to say, hey, you know, if you're looking for a solution with this kind of capabilities, these are the vendors, you know. So that is something that we, uh, in the um, cybersecurity and privacy advisory committee, can do. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and we certainly welcome that and want to participate more fully with you on that. Um, so one other I, point, I mean, you might actually take a hackathon approach, mm -hmm. and that may be something that we can have the next ICF or the next yeah, It's basically to set up a boundary use cases you run and allow people to come and exercise from the same capabilities so that you can see what you need to know in order to make a selection for a person. Because you should learn some things about where your map is at, what's important, what's willing to trade off in order to make some of these implementations work. And that might be an easier way for you to get into a more traditional acquisition selection modality. So I'm gonna cut in here, that was a, a great question. Thank you for bringing that to, to the panel. Um, I wanted to throw out one question and you know, would love everyone's feedback on it, but particularly Rand and Heather. Um, from your perspective working in, you know, in industry, where do you see that government could make the greatest investment to reduce risk in transportation? For us? Yeah. <laughs> or, or anyone. I, 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 and what is your perspective? But anyone is going to Well, and I don't know how you feel about it from, from. I feel uh, one thing government has already started doing is not that they haven't done uh, anything. But uh, one thing is the timeliness. That seems to be a consensus that people are wanting some standards. They cannot <coughs> arrive soon enough. It's like yesterday. 
We knew that it, um, right? Because of these outages, is um, you for the for profit sector, you're like, I am itching to go. There is a market, right? Do I deliver now? And then later on, when you publish standard, I have to revise, you know, come back first. And so there is a, a bit of demand in that, um, in that um, domain. And so we actually also took that from an earlier round table to uh, try to speed up um, as a support group so that we could uh, provide the advisory committee's um, summary to the government bodies, um, NIST, um, DHS,